So you use that? Oh, hello. Oh, can you hear me? Yeah, you can oh, hear me now. Okay. Hello, everyone. Welcome again to Michelangelo States. We'd like to introduce Michael and Graham from PCCP. <laughs> Hi, hello. Um, just trying to pick you all out. There's just so many to see. So, um, I'm Graham from VCCP Ad Agency in London. This is Michael. Hello there. From Hi. Ad Agency in London. Do you want to come in a little bit closer? <laughs> come on. Come on. It's all right. It's all right. You don't have to. Please. All right, fine. Let's go. Um, so this is a big tech conference. You could be asking yourselves, why are two people from advertising here? Um, we clearly didn't advertise our speaking thing very well. Um, what can you tell, tell us about digital? Well, I guess the first thing to ask is, what does advertising actually do? On a very base level, what advertising does is it tells people about what you do. It, gives, it spreads awareness. It might even just get your name out there, so that's useful. But um, if you drill into it a little bit further, actually what we do is we make promises to people that maybe, just maybe, if you buy our product, if you sign up to our service, your life might be a little bit better. It might be a little bit simpler. It might be a little bit easier. But really, increasingly what advertising and people like Michael and I work on is when you have dynamics like this. When you have products which are fundamentally pretty much the same thing. So how do I decide if I'm a Coke person or a Pepsi person? It's not really on taste. It's not really on how many bubbles are in the drink. I mean, they try doing it on taste. Do you have a Pepsi challenge? You used to do the Pepsi challenge? People used to go and go, hey, I like, Pe I like Pepsi's better than Coke. Go to the till, they buy Coke. Why was that? Because you don't buy Coke with your eyes shut, frankly. What you do is you buy into the idea of Coke, and that was the powerful thing. But even more so, whole markets are becoming commoditized. You look at, I mean, we work on O2. That's why we're here. Um, and you know, you've got Vodafone, 3, EE. They all fundamentally do exactly the same thing. They sell data, they make calls. There may be little nuances in terms of things that are a little bit cheaper, packages and things like that. But at, at the end of the day, they're all exactly the same. And what advertising does and what marketing can do is create the perception of difference, that actually there is a difference between Vodafone and O2. And then through the medium of marketing, in people's minds, create the illusion of difference. And that way, people can make an easier choice. Because at the end of the day, a lot of the benefits aren't immediately obvious. If you take a trainer, or a sneaker, or whatever you want to call it, from, from Nike and Adidas, they do the same thing. They're both light, both athletic, cost about the same, do about the same thing. But for some reason, you're attracted to one or the other. And that's because you've bought into just do it or take the stage. And that's what marketing can do, make a difference. And the reason this is relevant today, I'll get there eventually, is because the tech world is becoming like a supermarket now. If you go into the App Store, if you go into iTunes, if you go into the, the Android marketplace, it's like a big supermarket. It's full of thousands, if not millions of products, which are all kind of similar. I mean, technology is brilliant, but what it does mean is that everyone can very, very quickly learn and adapt and copy from each other. And consumers are faced with a challenge like this. So, if I want to go dating, which one do I choose? If I want to get a discount, which one do I choose? If I want to go running or fitness, there's so many now. And they all kind of do the same thing. And so how can we, through the power of storytelling, make some kind of difference in people's minds? So Graham has just talked about the increasing prevalence of similarity between ideas. Now, put yourself in the shoes of this potential investor that you're hoping to woo. And imagine this situation. He's had a long day. He's tired. He's frazzled because before you walked into the door, he heard 10 other pretty similar sounding ideas. And in your 10 minute pitch, you're probably gonna say, this is the new Facebook. You're gonna show them the same exponential growth curve that everyone else has done. And you're all gonna promise that this is gonna be the breakthrough app at next year's South by Southwest. Now in this situation, it is not always the best product that wins. It's the one that gets the funding. The final decision can come down to something far less rational, far more emotional. Who had the best story? Who's already getting the most buzz for that story? Who's being written about? Who's being talked about? Who's got those early adopters wanting you to succeed because they bought into your story? So why does this happen? Well, very simply, there's numerous studies from psychologists and neuroscientists all around the world that basically says one same thing. You know, from the earliest evidence of human behavior, we as human beings have brains that are hardwired for storytelling. 
we're hardwired to find storytelling appealing. And there's this great quote from Professor Jonathan Gottschall who said, human beings crave story, narrative shapes us as individuals and as cultures and from you know, cave paintings to the Bible to modern day children's stories, it's just something that's inherent to how we survive and later on how we socialize and how we develop and the thing is today we may no longer need to worry about being eaten by tigers outside our caves but the fact remains that today it's still fundamental to how we engage with new ideas. And storytelling is also how we remember stuff. So this is Mandarin as we all obviously know. Really beautiful, completely impenetrable and really really hard to learn. Tried it, it's really hard. Um, but what some clever people have done is use some storytelling techniques to try and help you remember stuff. So you see this, this one up there in the, in the top left, that's the sign for tree. And by weaving storytelling amount, amongst it, so three of those together, that's the sign for forest. The sign there, that's the sign for person, and the other one's the sign for, for house. Person inside the house, that means prisoner. And what they've done, and hopefully, that's a hell of a lot more memorable and a hell of a lot more easier to understand than just pragmatically learning on information because you've put it within the paradigm of a story. These lovely chaps, you know, their stories help to create their appeal. You know, Susan Boyle, Paul Potts, Jack Carroll, you know, big winners on talent shows, but ironically have very little talent. I mean, they could hold a note, they would probably win you know, a karaoke contest in the local pub. But there was nothing particularly remarkable about that talent that made them win. It was the fact that the backstory that got us hooked. So you've got Susan Boyle, this spinster with a hairy face who experiences this Cinderella moment right before our eyes. You've got Paul Potts, man down on his luck, heavily in debt, stuck in this dead end job, selling mobile phones, car phone warehouse, suddenly becomes a big opera singer. Jack Carroll, cute kid, quite funny jokes, but big thing is he refused to let his cerebral palsy affect his dream of performing stand up on stage in front of millions of people. They only won because we like their story the most. And if you take anything away with you, remember that spinsters with hairy faces can make it through the power of story for that. Um, I guess one of the most commonly held thing is that storytelling is the best way of passing on information. There's a reason why fairy tales are centuries and centuries old. It's because they've got life lessons and they've packaged it up in a way that makes it viral, that people can pass on. If you've got kids, telling them not to talk to strangers, quite compelling. Wrap it up in a story of the big scary wolf that scares the shit out of them, they'll remember that. And also, you know, the boy that cried wolf, again, turn it into a story, all of a sudden the lesson becomes more viral. Um, Rapunzel, the lesson of always using conditioner, they stay with us throughout life. So what does it have to do with you? What do these children's stories and these stories about cave paintings have to do with you? Well, the, the fact of the matter is, this isn't about prepping you to go on Dragon's Den. This is about showing you some practical examples to say that same power of the story applies when you tell your story, when you talk about your startup story. So what we wanted to do is show you um, four startups, you know, some of the most successful startups of the last five years, and just really dissect their story and how they tell theirs. Because the reason we chose these four is because I think you're probably all familiar with them. And what's interesting is that, even though some of them are years old now, they're still telling the same story on stages like this, in magazine interviews, on their website, and it hasn't really changed. It's evolved, it's been tweaked, but it's the same essence of the story and the reason why will become apparent. Yeah, and what we notice, and you'll notice if we go through this, there's patterns that emerge. They all say kind of the same thing. They've all got kind of the same story. I'm going to rattle through four now. First one's um, David, um, David Kampf, who set up Tumblr. And his little, the little nugget that we've brought out here is, um, is a bit about the humanity and the uncertainty of his vision. Now, he wasn't some guy who knew exactly what he was going to do. He wasn't sure. Uh, it was literally in between contracts. So we had a couple of weeks where we you know, were sitting on our hands, dicking around. And uh, I said, you know, let's just take a stab at this. This is something that I wanted to try for a, week, uh, for a while. Let's see how much we can pull together in a couple of weeks. And that was the very first crude version of Tumblr. And we kind of kept chipping away at it for a few more months until eventually it came together. Because Tumblr wasn't, you know, we were making money. We had all these great clients. We were having a lot of fun working on all these projects we were really proud of. 
And Tumblr was like one of those things. Um, and it seemed like a much bigger opportunity, but I just wasn't sure in the beginning. Um, and there were just a lot of people who you know, I, I really trusted, really admired, who were telling us that you know, that, was, that was the thing to go for. And you know, eventually, it, was, it took about six months before I just gave in and said, all right, I'm, I'm pissing off my clients who are not returning their calls. Tumblr seems to be where our hearts are. Let's go for it. So really humble, really unsure, really sort of geeky Justin Bieber haircut, but quite disarming. Um, this other one is um, Airbnb. So I guess one of those recent success stories. I mean, that over the last two years, these guys have absolutely exploded. And he's got another common element to his story, which is the whole sort of story of, of the happy accident, the thing that, you know, how all great inventions, this guy was walking down the street and all of a sudden he noticed something. That's another real common element to the, um, to the story. In 2007, we quit our jobs and we moved to San Francisco to fulfill our dream. We're living in this amazing apartment, downtown San Francisco. Beautiful space, high ceilings, lots of light. Sooner or later, though, we're running out of money. We're broke. And the bills are coming in, including a new rent bill. We had about 14 days to figure out how to pay this new rent. So we took a look around the living room. We discovered something. We had space. Look at all this extra space. It's all over the place. We thought, what can we do with this space? Then we learned that there's this design conference coming to town. All the hotels in San Francisco are sold out. Suddenly, our space looks a lot more interesting. Imagine, we could offer an air bed and then cook breakfast for our guests. By the end of the day, we had a concept called air bed and breakfast. So that's where Airbnb come from. So again, humble, happy accident, really, really human, kind of guys we can all identify with. You probably recognize this guy. This is um, Adam from Innocent. And his whole story is, again, a really simple thing. Simple, common problem, something we can all identify with. And hey, wouldn't life just be a little bit better if we did something about it? Well, every holiday we went on, it was exactly the same conversation. And about four years into our careers, we decided, right, last time we're going to have this conversation, we're going to come up with the idea, or we're just going to stop talking about it and just go on with our lives. So, how do we come up with a business idea? Well, we figured that if you could make life a little bit easier, or a little bit better for people, i.e. solve a problem, then maybe you could turn it into a business. Simple. So, we started to think about problems that we had in our lives. It was little bottles of unadulterated goodness. All the fruit you need for a day in a little bottle. And the problem this was solving was one that we all had in our own lives. We lived in London, worked hard, went out a lot, and felt guilty about not doing ourselves enough good. But if we could find a way of actually just balancing that bad, balancing that guilt, then maybe there was a business in it. So, what we did is we thought, well, the question we want answered is, should we give up our jobs to make these smoothies? So we thought, well, let's ask that. We crushed up 500 pounds of fruit, put it in bottles, and sold it at a little jazz festival that we used to run down in West London. We put up a big sign saying, should we give up our jobs to make these smoothies? And got people to vote for the empty bottles. Yes and no. Put, put the empty bottles in each bin. Now, at the end of the weekend, the yes bin was full. The no bin was pretty empty, other than those my mum was chucking in there. It's like, I paid for your education. Go back to cotton. Good job, you idiot. Um, and but that gave us the, the confidence, literally, to go in and resign. So the whole yes, no bin at Innocent is probably the most powerful startup story in this country. Maybe everybody's heard it. In terms of actually, I mean, he dramatizes it and says, like, should we yes or no give up our jobs? Probably wasn't that important. But the important side of that is that little nugget of story, that little human part of his company that makes you love the brand and makes you love the things behind it. If it was we had boring accountancy jobs and want to be millionaires, you wouldn't like them. But that little simple human disarming story just makes it all the more powerful. And the favorite one, is my, the final one's my favorite one. Those other three, they're all quite clever, suspiciously probably quite rich anyway. This bloke, complete sort of the earth cabbie. He's a geezer and his name's Gary. 
Gary Jackson from Stepney worked as a cabbie for 10 years. The idea for a new smartphone app came after a moan and groan over a cuppa with two other drivers. Yeah. We used to meet up and we used to talk about our frustrations and how we can create more work. It's not the best job in the world when there's no money coming in. So with the technology of the iPhone coming out, it was just uh, just thinking up of an idea of uh, connecting both customers and passengers. When the iPhone came out, <laughs> well, look. it all sounds wonderfully simple, doesn't it? I mean, the point we want to make about these four stories None of these were first to market, and it's often the assumption that that's all you need to do. You know, they weren't particularly radical or unique. You know, smoothies were sold in supermarkets before Innocent came along, they just weren't selling very well. You know, there were apps like Airbnb trying to bring together room renters and travellers, they just weren't very successful. You know, Hailer and Tumblr, much better UX than some of their competitors, but nothing so radical that that in itself made them revolutionary. Because that's not the memorable bit. The memorable bit is the personal story. So we start to deconstruct how that story is put together. Now, this next slide you'll see might look like a series of revenue projections, but actually it's an example of all the different types of narrative arcs that have been mapped. And what they do is they represent the flow and progression of story. They talk about setting and conflict and climax, falling action, resolution. And they all tend to start at the bottom and then they rise with increasing drama and then back down again to resolution. Now, each of these startup stories that you've watched today, you've just heard do exactly the same thing. They take the reader or the listener on a journey with a similar arc. And the reason they do that, and the reason they're successful, is because it's what we've become hardwired to expect. It is how we learn and understand. And that narrative arc is probably the basis of 90% all the stories that you have read in your life, all the films that you've watched, and all the plays that you've been to, and even some of the games that you've played. And even that arc can be simplified even more into something that's called a four-box narrative. Now, four-box narrative is something you'll recognize in many things. It goes something like this. Box one, everyone was living happily. Box two, a dragon appears and threatens to destroy everything. Box three, luckily a knight comes along to slay the dragon. And box four, great news, everyone lives happily ever after. Now that construct you'll find in many, many different types of films. You know, just go through all the films that you have at home and, and they'll, they'll work to this. You know, every Clint Eastwood Western has this construct. You know, at the other end of things, every Pixar and Disney film, same thing. You're probably thinking, well, these are films and children's stories. What does this have to do with my tech startup story, but let's apply that structure to these studies. So you know, let's start with Tumblr. So, I mean, you kind of, hello. Um, you kind of got um, Tumblr's one is very, very similar. So we're all bloggers. However, the big corporate arseholes out there, so you know, the, the big tech giants, they wanted money. They wanted to advertise. So he came along. I'm a hero. You know what? I want to make a version in my own bedroom. Bedroom's really important. The whole mythology of the bedroom and the garage is a real recurrent theme because we've all got them and we can sympathise with them. And do you know what? I did it myself and now millions more non-geeks are blogging for free and everyone loves it and me. The whole democratic, it's not because I wanted to make loads of money and get famous. Oh, no, 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 no. It's because I wanted to make life better for everyone else. That's a big recurrent theme. Halo's for our next narrative is you know, very easy. You know, Technology means great news. We can book taxis via apps. But what's the problem? Well, it's not really taking off because no one really gets what's really needed. Box three, here comes the hero. Well, I'm an ex-cabbie. I know how to make this work. And the big difference is that I'm going to start with getting the cabbies on board. And box four, happily ever after. Well, now Halo is loved by drivers and passengers. It's what we do. It has completely revolutionized the way people book cabs today. Final one's Airbnb. EasyJet, people like that, they open up the world. It's brilliant, you can travel. Hotels are really expensive and they're really boring with brass and beige curtains. So, but there's millions of empty bedrooms out there, so I'm going to come into the hero. I took a massive risk, I nearly lost my house. But you know what? I made this thing that allowed people to travel and be happy and have babies with each other. And now, Airbnb is loved by everybody and travellers across the world can have a great experience of the great place that we live in. This is, is that, you. Is it me? Okay. <laughs> and um, so they're the four boxes, and we thought they're quite good. But what Mike and I wanted to do is try and give you some simple sort of rules. So if you've got a startup, or if you're advising a startup, or you're working with a startup, 
what's kind of like a little bit of a toolkit. Bearing all this genius insight in mind, what are, what's are some easy steps that we can apply, that I can apply to the people that I work with? So, first one is an element of jeopardy and risk. And the important thing as well is that, you know, that there's a saying in Fleet Street is that don't let the truth get in the way of a good story. These guys, make no mistake about it, Tumblr, Airbnb, all of them, they've amplified elements of this story. And the key one to get people interested is jeopardy and risk. What did they put at stake? It's really boring if it's like, I had this great job and I did this thing in my spare time and then I made even more money. That's not, that's not interesting. Somebody living on the breadline, they were just about to lose their job or get divorced or something like that. And, you know, the, the jeopardy, what was at stake? What have you got at stake in your business? What did you give up in order to pursue your dream? Number two, serendipity and sudden twists of fate, because we all have that. And we've just watched too many Hollywood movies, so there's almost this expectation now that fates and that eureka moment are totally intertwined. So, you know, Joe Gebber from Airbnb says, you know, we had about 14 days to figure out how to pay this new rent. So we just looked around our living room and there it was right in front of us. We had space. And then this lovely piece of serendipity. Oh, look. There's a design conference happening at the same time and everyone wants space. So suddenly everything starts to come together. You know, this other example we've used, Nick D'Aloisi, who's probably the UK startup story of the year. You know, this 16-year-old school kid tells the story of how he was just doing his history homework, trying to find some interesting facts about history, when he found that, you know, he wasn't really getting the results he wanted and it wasn't very efficient, he was getting distracted. And he goes, well, I thought, is there a way to evaluate the content quickly so I could save time? And that's when I thought of Sumbly. It sounds wonderfully simple, doesn't it? This eureka moment. And the good thing about these eureka moments is that it's far better than say, well, I just decided to, do, to make the UX better. I'm just better at coding these things. I found an algorithm that makes simplification simpler and more efficient to do because this is the sort of stuff that journalists like to write about and they certainly have done with Nick D'Aloisi. Modesty and, and humble roots. I mean, again, no one wants to hear the story of, I was amazing and this is how I became more amazing. It's just, it's more about, you know, I'm just like you and me. And that we'll come into this a little bit later on, towards the end, is that key to this is the humbleness of it. I didn't do this for myself. I didn't do this to make money. I just do, do things to make it a little bit better. You lace the language of the innocent guy. It wasn't like I wanted to save the world and make children healthier. It was like, if I just did this little thing, then maybe, just maybe, this thing might happen. They all talk like that in a really, really humble and modest way. It's very, very disarming. And um, this is Hewlett and Packard's shed, if anyone recognizes it. Another part of the story and the mythology of the startups. There's a reason why no startup happens in blocks of flats, because they don't have garages and they can't do it. Um, but they have bedrooms, so they can. Um, but this is just another part of it, is that, you know, you think about Bill Gates, it's the garage. You think about all these Airbnb guys, it's in my mum's house, it's in the flat. It's all about humble, it's all about accessibility, it's all about, you know what, it could be me, I could do that. He's a guy that I can empathise with. Number four, soul. If you notice from those videos, not one of them talked about money. Because it's not about the money for them. It's never about the money. It's bigger than that. It's something more noble. It's a higher order purpose. It's a calling. It's a passion. And it makes us want them to win. Because who wouldn't? You know, if there's a bunch of hard-nosed competitors out there who are only in it for the money, well, who are you going to put your money with? Who are you going to prefer? And again, you know, this quote from Adam Ballons, who's saying, you know, Every business needs to have a purpose, and ours is just to make healthy, natural food to help people live well and die old. What a great guy. You know, Steve Jobs, the ultimate richest hippie in the world, you know, would always say things like, being the richest man in the cemetery doesn't matter to me. It's all about going to bed at night, saying we've done something wonderful. That's really what matters to me. And we've kind of touched on this again. It's the empathy point, is that, why did I do it? I did it for people like me. I did it for me and my mates. I gave things to make life easier for people like my mates and me and you. I, gave, I did it within the dynamic of something that you can understand. So, I guess one of the questions you might be asking after listening to all these wonderfully crafted stories is, well, how true is this? You know, how genuine do these stories have to be? Now, this chap, I think most of you will know, that's uh, Stelios Haji Yuanu, the founder of EasyJet. And he's often portrayed as this guy, this risk-taking entrepreneur who brought air travel to the masses. You know, he took on the corporate beasts of BA and they tried to stop him, they made him nervous. 
plucky Stelios who started out with six planes in Luton Airport and has built an empire worth billions. It is one of the most famous startup stories of the last 50 years. And what tends to not get mentioned in the telling of that story is the fact that Stelios also happens to be the son of a Greek shipping billionaire. And his dad lent his son a small sum of 200 million pounds so that he could lease some planes and set up the business. Now, let's be absolutely clear, Stelios has never, ever denied the fact that he got quite a bit of help. But the fact of the matter is, he doesn't tell that story, and we don't, no one writes about that bit of the story because it just doesn't really fit with the one we want to hear. It doesn't fit with this myth of Stelios as this folklore hero, this David taking on the Goliaths. So it's rarely mentioned. And in the same way that, you know, we are conditioned to prefer happy, clean resolutions to, to our films rather than as unresolved, messy endings, you know, if there's a bit of your story that just doesn't quite fit with the narrative, then you know, ask yourself, you know, does it need to be in there? But what I would say is probably don't lie, because you'll probably get found out, and then you'll look stupid, and you'll get rumbled, and you'll get in a lot of trouble. Yeah. Um, this, I think, is the biggest point. And I think Michael and I were talking about it this week when we were putting this deck together, which was, what is it about these stories? What is this common thread that binds them all together and makes them little pieces of information that we like to tell and pass on? And I think you put all those elements together, the jeopardy, the risk, the common day, the serendipity, the guy walking down the street and suddenly realizing something, the guys you know, in a flat just like mine that realized I had to pay the rent. And what it is about all of those stories is that it could be us. And that's what we love about it. Because every single one of us likes to think that we've got this little enterprising idea somewhere locked away in our head that, you know what? I could be the next one of those guys. I can put myself in the Tumblr position, in the Airbnb position. I could be the guy that's in the flat and suddenly realize that if I've put a mattress there, I can pay the rent. All of those things, the humble, the empathy, it's all about building around a dynamic that makes it a story where you want them to win. And the reason you want them to win is because it could be you. The lottery here is, is quite a good example as well, which is every week, middle-class people with three cars and a lovely house win a million pounds. Do we hear about them? Do we buggery? Because it's a crap story and nobody cares and there's nothing great about that. What we do hear about is the mum with 15 kids who's on the breadline and they're starving and, they're, and they've got rickets because they're so poor. But the lottery comes in and it rescues them. It's a great story. Stories win out over everything because they are the things that we like to pass on. And so the five question thing that I was referring to before that I forgot was coming now, this is it here. Um, so five questions to ask yourself. What is the genesis of the idea? What's that little spark that made you do what you're currently doing? And just think back at it and, and, and gloss it and make it human. Where's the jeopardy and where's the uncertainty? Where's the risk? Where's the bit where you're rooting for you? Where you're thinking, God, he's really put it on the line here. What's the moment of ingenuity? What's the bit where if I just twisted this and put that in there, all of a sudden it makes the world difference? Where's the little mental leap that isn't about a piece of code or a bit of mashing up technology and Wi-Fi signals? It's about where's the little bit of genius that anyone could come up with? Where are you going? What's next? And then finally, and this is also really important. Who within your organization is the best person to tell that story? Because for every innocent founder, for every David Camp who's quite geeky and charming and looks a bit like Justin Bieber, there's people behind him that are just as important, but they're not as good as telling the story. They haven't got the charisma. They haven't got the believability. Think about that. Think about who within your organization is the best person to tell this story on behalf of your brand. Um, so we thought how we're going to end this and we thought this is all theory and all that sort of stuff. And um, because we work for O2, they've got a thing called Wira, which you may have heard about, startup thing, it's bloody brilliant. And um, we got in contact with Drummond here, and uh, he's got a great little story and a great little business. And um, we took him through his deck this morning. And um, we kind of want to do a little run through here. So Drummond, if you want to come up. This is the bit where we convert to a chat show style format. So, <laughs> why don't you sit over there and we will try to casually interrogate you. <laughs> Do I mind doing it? Yes. Okay, good. Um, 
So what we want to try and do is like a before and after thing, where the one at the beginning is quite good, but the one at the end is amazing. Um, and uh, Drummond, because he is someone who's actively touting for cash, has got a great little elevator pitch already done. Which I mean, anybody that's done the whole VC thing, you know that's the first thing you do. So if you'd like to just maybe just go where you were before you met us. Yeah. Okay, um, so Go Car Share is a website that connects drivers who have spare seats in their car with passengers or kind of pe people who want to go the same way so they can share car journeys and save money. Um, another way of explaining it is that it's a marketplace for empty car seats. There's a big focus on trust, so it's through Facebook you can see if you share friends, have similar interests, and we're working with a lot of festivals, things like Reading and Leeds festivals where we have special, special partnerships, priority car parks. We've got over 20,000 users and we're really excited about taking this forward. So, Thank you. <laughs> I guess the first question we have to ask is, I mean, yeah. this elevator pitch is clearly having some effect, isn't it? I mean, it's working, you're using it quite often. You've clearly got your pattern, you know, pretty nailed down that you can actually do that within the 30 seconds that you often get. If we were to go back to those five questions, which I'm going to just sort of casually go over here and do. Um, I'll do this. What's my... Um, I know, I don't, no, don't need to do it anymore. <laughs> This is very well rehearsed. Um, I guess the, the, the first question is, if we we're going to look at the genesis thing uh, of the idea. Why don't you tell us about the start? I mean, have you always wanted to do this? I think um, I've always wanted to do a startup in some capacity from a really young age. Actually, um, I read Richard Branson's autobiography when I was 18, and that was kind of something I definitely kind of saw myself as wanting to do. Um, but I kind of got to the end of university and I still didn't feel like I had this like killer idea as such and actually kind of to kind of like fell into being an accountant which right. um, wasn't like a really kind of like happy time for me but all the time whilst I was being an accountant I was always kind of like thinking of ideas yeah. uh, for businesses that I'd like to start and I guess this was kind of like the one idea that really felt like it had So potential. what was happening? I mean what was the inspiration for it? Um, so it's actually it's actually on kind of whilst I was an, an, an accountant, it was on one sort of like particularly unhappy day, like long sort of like training for accounting exams, um, and I was walking down the street close to where I live in West London. Like I can't remember, like it was, it was at the beginning of the credit crunch, um, and just seeing this queue of stationary cars, like one person in each car, and it just the whole idea like, of people like travelling on their own suddenly to me seemed crazy. And like if you could match people using the internet. Um, that seemed like a really good opportunity to do something kind of positive in terms of reducing right. congestion and carbon emissions. Right. So, and you know, in order to take that idea forward, I mean, I, I'm thinking that there must have been some element of, of sacrifice involved because, how you know, were you able to actually carry on being an accountant and do this, or was, did you have to stop? So I think so. I, mean, I was actually in a position where I was like particularly kind of like um, sort of like stressed and sort of like um, at work. So I kind of found it very difficult um, to kind of make much progress with it. But I kind of I think I developed the idea. And one of the interesting things I kind of noticed was there's this big opportunity of you linking this car sharing idea, but with Facebook. So you could kind of see well this person is a friend of a friend, or they've kind of um, they've got similar interests. And I kind of I kind of realised that though there were kind of similar concepts, no one had really done it in a kind of social way that kind of appealed to a, a younger market. Um, so yeah, and I did come to that point where I was like, actually, I think this idea has got some sort of legs, but I've really got to, um, I, I can't do my job at the same time, yeah. And that, 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 that was a little bit of, um, that was a little bit of genius that I, I really liked about this story, because car sharing, carpooling, nothing new, been around for ages. But one of the big barriers, certainly in, in England, where we're all quite shy, um, is, who wants to get in a car with a stranger? Not really, that's a massive barrier to the business. Yeah. But just by plugging in Facebook and actually running it through your Facebook friends, you don't have to be in a car with a stranger. It may not be someone you know directly, but you might know them second hand. You can look at their profile, see if they are properly weird or not. Um, and that was a, that's the little genius moment to me, and that's quite key. So what about things you had to sacrifice? Because I mean, you mentioned that you did have to take this risk of, of, of leaving a, a safe full-time job. Yeah. You know, to do this, but what else did he have to do? So I think I think it's kind of quite hard. So when when I decided to do it, I think this kind of whole ecosystem wasn't nearly as developed as it is now. There's lots of kind of obvious places to go for help. Whereas when I started, it wasn't. So I kind of acknowledged that I really I've got this idea. I'm really passionate about it, but I don't really know a huge amount about how to progress it. And so actually, at aged um, 28, I decided to first like quit my job and actually go and live with my parents, which is kind of 
Yeah, it's not kind dignified. of it's not yeah, it's not kind of it's not a great situation. And also I think just like basically had to completely lock down any kind of like expenditure. So a lot of my right. friends just didn't see for kind of quite right. a long time. And did you give yourself a certain amount of time that you would, you know, live this frugal, slightly humiliating life? Yeah, no, I, I, th I think I did. I think I think I actually kind of, um, I think I sort of set sort of like certain circumstances. That if this doesn't happen by this date, yeah. then we're gonna, well, I'm just gonna jack it in. And I think, right. well, actually, I think everything does take a lot longer than you think. But there, yes. there were sort of like certain sort of like green shoots of things like starting to happen at that point. And just you know, finally, you mentioned your elevator pitch. There's some there's some really good momentum behind the business now. You've talked about twenty thousand users, but. You know, that's, that's a great start, but do you have a, a bigger benchmark of success? You know, do you have this sense, well, I know I've done it, I know what I've succeeded when I've done this? I think so. I mean, so, I mean the, the stat, one of the stats I have is there's 38 million empty car seats that travel around um, Britain every single day, which is kind of ridiculous. And like most cars, if you look at most cars, they just have like one person in. So I think it's when you get to the point that actually you look at a car and there's generally kind of a few people in it and they're having a fun time. And actually people kind of see this as being a way of traveling, just like you jump on a, the train or you, you, if you're going a long distance, you take the plane. Like car sharing is a, a kind of yes. viable option. Yeah. And that, that was another, when we were chatting, Stats are great as well. They're great things to make. Do you know 38 empty seats every day around the country? That's a great stat. I think it's 38 and million. 38 million. Yeah. Uh, there's a silent million, it's yeah. French. And, um, <laughs> the, um, but then you compare that to planes and things like that, you think, if there were planes, if there, are there 38 million empty plane seats, 38 million empty train seats? No, there aren't. And all of a sudden, this slightly weird, wacky car sharing idea doesn't seem so weird. In fact, it looks like an untapped resource. In fact, it looks like a bit of an opportunity. And so you frame those things into the things that people can understand with those little nuggets of like, you know, make it campaignable. You know, my dream is no more empty car seats. All of a sudden you've summed it up. My dream is to make it as efficient as air travel. Mm. Position it like that, and you're not just a nutty hippie kid who wants to go to free festivals anymore. You want somebody, you're somebody that actually has got a viable business. So if, if we were gonna sum up and, and go back to that sort of checklist of five things, I mean, there's, there's certain things that you would definitely pick out. I mean, from a starting point, the genesis of this dream of always wanting to have an idea, this frustration of ending up as an accountant and this moment of revelation, like right? you say, you just happened to be walking along Wandsworth Road and then it, it came to you. I mean, that is a wonderful story to tell in itself because it has those elements of serendipity and, and, and eureka in them. I mean, the risk and empathy bit, I think, is, is what a lot of startup people have had to do. You know, they've had to walk away from the safe job. But, you know, you bring a bit of empathy into it by the fact that, you know, at the age of 28, you had to move back in with your parents. You know, that's, yeah. that's quite a big sacrifice yeah. that a lot of people go, I can't imagine that being much fun. Yeah. Um, you know, this third thing, what's your moment of ingenuity? Well, I think this whole thing, as Graham said, you know, this recognition that everyone else is talking about the practical side, you know, functional stuff, commuting to work and the benefit of car sharing, was you recognized that by linking into Facebook, you can actually start to make it more of a social thing, that it's not just about convenience, actually it's about fun. And no one else is doing in that. And through Facebook, you can focus on a specific target audience. You started talking about you know, festivals as, as, a, as a good um, way to target the right people. I think, you know, back to this vision thing, yeah. I think there's a great vision story there. And this whole thing of 38 million empty car seats that are waiting to be filled, you know, it's a fantastic vision. And you know, as Graham said, it suddenly makes what seems like a, a strange thing, you know, why would I let a stranger into my car? And, and this sudden notion that, well, why wouldn't you? Because it's perverse not to. Yeah, who hasn't and it suddenly becomes been in a car staring at traffic and not seeing all the empty seats? That's, I think that's the real moment of humanity in this story. Of like, actually, God, I've noticed that. And actually, you know, it's something we can all empathize with, something we can all relate to. It's not like, I noticed a small comma that was missing from this huge ocean of code. It's not a big geeky thing. It's something really, really simple. So look, I think those are our building blocks and those are the yeah. fundamental elements of the story. But I guess the real <laughs> test is, you know, can we see how, does, can, do you reckon you could turn that into an elevator pitch now? You want to have, have yeah, a go? Um, I mean, this is going to be yeah. a bit rough and ready. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But um, um, do you want to have a go? Yeah. Um, so, okay, I'll give it a try. So um, basically, I guess from the age of 18, I've always wanted to be an entrepreneur. And that came from reading Richard Branson's um, autobiography, 
at the age of 18. Um, but so I think I was constantly thinking of ideas of things I wanted to do when I was at university in terms of like starting a business, but I didn't really have this kind of like killer idea in terms of what I could do and ended up actually being an accountant, which was um, kind of quite a frustrating time for me and felt like very unfulfilled. Um, but like one day I was walking down the street very close to where I live in West London and just kind of had this mini eureka moment when I noticed that pretty much every single car had only one person uh, traveling in the car. And it just felt like there's a really real kind of like positive opportunity um, to do something with this um, situation. So actually at the age of um, 28, I left my job um, as an accountant and moved back to live with my parents, uh, which is quite a difficult um, decision to make. And yeah, particularly I think I had to make kind of quite a lot of sacrifices, not just like financially, but actually um, it's hard because I think I've kind of lost kind of contact with quite a lot of, kind of my friends just because um, being out kind of away from them, but like fin financially when you're kind of living li different lifestyles, it's um, pretty difficult. But I kind of really believed in the idea um, I felt really kind of like passionate about it and I think there's an opportunity what, we, what we're doing linking people in with Facebook so you can see if you share friends have, have similar interests and kind of getting a whole different group of younger people involved in this um, idea of um, car sharing and I think finally now we're getting to the point where it's actually got really good moment momentum we've got um, over 20,000 users on the site and some really big festivals such as Glastonbury and Reading and Leeds festivals are doing partnerships with us but actually most importantly we've got a really good team now that's kind of helping drive this forward and I think in the future um, I'd love to um, just in the way that kind of Richard Branson wouldn't like tolerate having um, a half empty plane or a half empty train I think that's something that we can replicate with car travel and fill, fill up these 38 million empty car seats that travel around the country every single day that's brilliant <laughs> so I guess the question was you know how does that work for you I mean did that feel like you were telling a better, you? You were yeah. telling a better story? Or well, I think, this, yeah, I think it did, because I think one of the frustrating things is I feel like I'm really passionate yeah. about what I'm doing, but sometimes I know that doesn't come across, and people say, you're like, you need to sort of sound more excited, and it's like, surely I do. But I think when, when you actually go down to the emotional level, that's much more interesting than talking about the statistics, I think, if you mm. can get the story into it, yeah. And what, what you could take from that as, you, as a pass on of all stories, like, I met this guy, he's got this car sharing thing, there's 38 million empty car seats every day in the UK. And with his thing, you can use Facebook to hook up with mates to go on your journeys much cheaper. All, you know, all of a sudden, there it is in a tiny little thing. And um, much more shareable, much more pass onable, hopefully. I think, I think that one of the interesting things is that um, sometimes when you're running a startup, it's really hard for you as the individual to see what the, mm. the story is. And you kind of actually need it like teased out of you. Just, I guess this is kind of like a really good framework for just kind of working it out. And I think... I think I mentioned it earlier, but it's like when, when, I, when I was starting, I was definitely, I was like, I need to find the story in this, but it's only yeah. kind of like sometimes later that it actually becomes more obvious what the story is. Mm -hmm. Brilliant. Well, cool. look, thank you very much for being such a brilliant guinea yeah. pig. Mm -hmm. um, so please give a round of applause to Drum and Give It, Gilbert of Go Car Share. And um, that is the end of our presentation. I mean, obviously, we have to end with a pretentious quote, so here it here comes. Um, it is from the philosopher, uh, Edward de Bono, and he said, that creativity is the last legal competitive advantage. So I think our final words based on that are just don't forget to use it. And that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you.